Uh, it's a pleasure to invite you to this uh, session with uh, David Goodhart, who is Head of Demography at the Policy Exchange in Britain. Um, we've had a few words before we came up, and he had some very interesting things to say indeed. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing from you. All right. Please. <coughs> thanks very much. Um, and thanks. thanks for the invitation. Um, I, um, I mean, I, I am going to talk a bit about Brexit, but this is not really about, or at least not about sort of Brexit current affairs, as it were. Um, um, it's more about the kind of the background to the, the value divides in Britain that, that, that led to the, to the famous protest vote. Um, oh, here we go. Um, and um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'll just kind of run through some of my the basic thesis in the book I wrote in 2017 called The Road to Somewhere, um, which was trying to, trying to explain and understand what had happened uh, in my country. Um, um, I will then kind of <coughs> move on to <coughs> um, some of the, the, the current flux in uh, both in British party politics and indeed on the, the Brexit front. Um, but anyway, I mean, just, just to sort of kick off, so, I mean, my, my, my basic thesis is that we, you know, 2016, Trump, Brexit, the rise of populism in, in much of Europe, um, um, not so much in Ireland, um, happened not because of demagogic uh, populist politicians, they played a small role perhaps, but because of this extraordinary 30-year liberal wave, really from the end of the Cold War, I guess, um, you know, through to um, now, that we had this extraordinary and unprecedented opening uh, of markets, of movement of people, um, thanks in part, part to, the, to the end of the Cold War, thanks in part, I think an important element in the story that is often downplayed is the acceptance by the main centre-left parties, the, the New Democrats in the US, New Labour in the UK, of the, at least a substantial part of the of the market reforms of the of the Thatcher Reagan era, um, so and we had um, a movement towards much more open trade. I mean, the what Danny Roderick called the sort of hyper globalization of the WTO compared to, um, to compared to the GATT arrangements. China joining the WTO in 2001. You know, the movement of the supply chain, large parts of the supply chain to the Far East, uh, and of course that was replicated to some extent inside the European Union. Um, 1992 represented, you know, the Maastricht Treaty, with the beginnings of the of a political rather than an economic euro, um, the um, the in introduction of the idea of EU citizenship, which was later to have such an impact, I think, in the form that free movement took after 2004. Um, just just generally a kind of weakening of national social contracts um, that that inevitably accompanied that opening. Um, and, you know, what one might call, what Ivan Rogers has called, technocratic depoliticisation. I mean, the, the idea that sort of rational people in, in committees, WTO or EU or other committees, um, can come to entirely rational decisions about uh, the future of economic and, um, I mean, it, it, things that go right to the heart in many cases of national autonomy and national sovereignty were increasingly decided in sort of anonymous committees that... Um, um, that were not directly, at least, accountable to national um, democratic um, voters. Um, then, of course, we had the financial crisis in 2008. So, I mean, my main point is that there was a kind of there was a kind of reckoning um, that was coming. It, we didn't. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think for, for various reasons that, I, that I'll go on to explain. I think we didn't um, predict predict this, but there were there was quite a large body of um, of, of opinion in our, in our democracies that was felt very uncomfortable about much of this change that we didn't hear from, um, partly because the, the, the main parties of centre-right and centre-left, not just in the UK but across, across much of Europe, you know, had, had, had accepted this, the so-called sort of double liberalism, market liberalism plus social and cultural liberalism. Um, and... Um, what was happening, I think, <laughs> is that sort of below the surface, there, w there were, um, there was a certain um, inarticulate hostility to what was happening, 
uh, like I say, it wasn't really expressed politically until um, suddenly, well, I mean, that's not true. I mean, it had been, I mean, in much of, you know, we, we go back to it was 2001 or two, was it, when um, Jean-Marie Le Pen uh, in France, you know, um, got into the final round of the presidential election. So, I mean, and we had the, we had the, the kind of sudden implosion of um, the model multicultural state, the Netherlands, um, uh, in, uh, I think in the same year. So, of course, there had been sort of early tremors. Um, but it, what, what was really happening, I think, was that under the surface, political concerns were switching from the standard socioeconomic concerns of the post-war era, um, a politics based around social class, um, arguments about, about the, the, the rightful place of markets and states, levels of public spending, levels of uh, redistribution and so on. This was the sort of main stuff of politics. Um, there we go. Um, and this was shifting below the surface. It was shifting to a much more, um, as I say, socio-cultural, value-based um, form of, um, of political identity. Um, so you know, the, the switch from socio-economic to socio-cultural meant a switch to a much greater concern with, with identities, with national identities, with borders, with immigration issues, etc. And obviously, there's, there's the, 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 these two forms of politics sort of coexist and overlap. Um, but the way I expressed it in my book was to look at, um, I, I talked about the people who see the world from anywhere, an increasingly um, significant minority in our societies, people who are overwhelmingly highly educated. Um, <laughs> Uh, in, the, in the case of the UK, um, I think to a slightly lesser extent in Ireland, and actually to a considerably lesser extent in continental Europe, and indeed even in America, um, there is a very strong connection between being educated and being mobile in the UK because of residential universities. I mean, even now, uh, we have many more working class and ethnic minority students going into higher education, and that has reduced the proportion somewhat uh, of residential, the residential experience in higher education, but it's still something like 75% of undergraduates in the UK leave home and invariably never go back to home, at least to, to live permanently in wherever they've come from. It creates a much kind of more um, sort of, sort of deracinated, um, but I'm not just talking about elites here, I'm talking about sort of big professional class who, um, who socialise amongst themselves, um, who tend... I mean, when I first wrote my book and I was sort of doing sort of book tour, I would often you know, talk to audiences of obviously mainly, mainly anywhere highly educated people, and I would say, you know, how many, how many of you um, are graduates? And almost everybody would put their hand up. Um, and I'd say, hey, you know, how many of you have close friends who are non-graduates? And very few people would would put their hands up. That, that is actually much less true even in the United States and much of continental Europe. You, know, you can be a, you know, a liberal-minded graduate and still have a friend who's a plumber or an electrician. Um, that's relatively rare recently, in, in any case, in the UK so because of this, because of higher education partly. So, so the anywheres, the people who see the world from anywhere tend to be educated, mobile, tend to be secular, tend to value all the things you'd expect people who live that life to value autonomy, um, openness, they can ride the social fluidity of modern societies relatively comfortably. Um, about 20-25% um, I, I put in that uh, category. There is then a larger but much less politically influential group called the, the somewheres, tend to be much less well educated, tend to be much more rooted, value, security, um, familiarity, tradition, more, um, and um, they, um, I think the two, the, the two key differences between, um, the two key political differences in a way between anywheres and somewheres is attitudes to social change, like I say, anywheres tend to be comfortable with it, somewheres much less so, and also attitudes to group attachment, something that anywheres tend to have quite, tend to, to have quite weak group attachments because of their mobility, um, whereas somewheres often their identities are bound up in, in place and group. And indeed, the, um, sort of alongside my 
anywhere, somewhere categorization. It's quite useful, I think, to think about the, the American sociologist talk at Parsons um, talked about um, human identity being on this sort of spectrum between achieved at one end and ascribed at the other. And, and, ach and achieved, anywheres tend to have achieved identities, meaning they have a sense of themselves that comes from their own achievements. You know, you pass exams when you're young, you go to more or less good university, you have a more or less successful professional career. You have a sense of yourself as kind of self-invented. Um, and that gives you an identity that is sort of inherently portable, um, uh, sort of porous and portable. You can fit in almost anywhere. You know, you, you're quite happy living in a sort of edgy inner city area surrounded by ethnic minorities, say, because you have a sense of yourself that is not particularly related to place or group. Whereas if you're somewhere, you, you, you're at the, uh, tend to be at the ascribed end, and your sense of yourself comes much more from um, your, your group and place. You know, you're a working class Geordie, you're a Scottish farmer, you're a Cornish housewife. I don't know, you, you, your sense of yourself comes from those things. And that means if, you're, you know, if your group or your, your place changes for whatever reasons, social change, high levels of immigration, whatever, your identity is much more susceptible to being discomforted by that. Um, now, the, um, the, these differences, um, it, it, I mean, it sort of seems very simplistic and binary, and, and I mean, the, one of the main criticisms of my book was this was all too binary, but actually, um, if you, uh, as authors tiresomely say at this stage, if you buy and read my book, you will discover that in fact it's full of shades of grey. Um, there are lots of different kinds of um, anywheres. You know, at the, at the sort of high end, you have the, you know, the people I call the global villages, the kind of people that uh, Theresa May was having a pop at in her famous Citizen <laughs> Nowhere speech. Um, um, but they're quite a small, you know, the kind of metropolitan elite is, is, a, is a subset. I mean, I'm, you know, anywheres are a much, much bigger group. Like I say, 25, 30% of the population now probably. Um, and similarly, with, with, with somewheres, there are lots of different kinds of somewheres. Um, at the bottom end, um, there's probably a, you know, 5 7%, depending on the context of people who are genuinely authoritarian and xenophobic. Uh, but most somewheres I wouldn't, I wouldn't put in that box. Um, so, uh, um, but the important thing I want to emphasize here is also I, I, um, I've invented these labels, but I haven't invented the value groups. They really are there in the data, as the academics like to say. I mean, I spent a lot of time with my nose in the British Social Attitude Survey, this wonderful source that goes, it began in the early 80s, and basically they've asked the same question across a whole host of political and cultural and social um, um, factors o over the last, whatever it is, sort of 40 years or so. Um, and you, you know, if, if you kind of interrogate the British Social Attitude Surveys, this, I would suggest, is roughly what you would come up with roughly what I came up with anyway. Um, one could argue a little bit about the proportions I've attributed to different groups. Um, but so I haven't invented, the, the value groups really are there. Um, and of course, both of, these, both of these sort of big sort of fuzzy worldviews are also completely legitimate, at least in their mainstream <coughs> form. And therein, in a way, lies the problem that, you know, that we, have this, um, we have this value divide and it manifested itself very much in the Brexit vote, obviously. I mean, I'm, my, um, my next book is kind of on this subject. I mean, I'm sort of um, delving deeper into the problem of um, meritocracy, um, in a sense, the kind of way in which we kind of value people. Um, and I, I'm, one of the arguments I want to make is that, that one form of human aptitude, cognitive ability, has become far too much the gold standard of human esteem. Um, and we've seen... You know, it's part of, you might say it's part of liberal modernity and the rise of the individual as against the group that, um, but many institutions that used to give you unconditional recognition, family, God, I mean religion, organized religion, nation, you are unconditionally recognized by these institutions and they have all weakened and will continue to weaken. Um, leaving some people feeling more psychologically naked. Um, so I think we've, we've seen the rise of uh, a kind of cognitive class. Obviously, they've always been there to some extent, but I think they've become, become much more self-confident. 
um, much more powerful. They have shaped the institutions of modern society. Um, you know, just look at the list. I mean, you know, we, we, it's the knowledge economy. We call it the knowledge economy. I mean, it's there in the title. It obviously works in the interests of people who are highly educated more than others. You've seen a draining away of status from lots of non-graduate employment. You've seen the huge, as I've touched on already, huge, huge expansion of higher education in Ireland, Britain, everywhere pretty much. Um, and certainly in the UK, not perhaps so much here than the, the sort of historic neglect of technical and vocational qualifications and so on. The massive economic openness I talked about earlier, mass immigration, uh, you know, the kind of double whammy effect. You know, if you worked in a factory in the Midlands or the north of England, your factory closes, you kind of, you sort of accept that. You know, you know that you live in a more interconnected global economy. Um, you you, you realise that your your part of your own increases in your income depends on that. So, um, so your factory closes and goes to China or Vietnam or whatever, but then when a whole workforce is imported to compete with you, you know, in the new service jobs you're, you're then doing, you're, you're, you're sort of thinking, well, hang on a sec, you know, what about kind of national citizenship? You know, is there not such a thing as um, fellow citizen favouritism? And it turns out that there isn't when it comes to, I don't know, you know, welfare, the, the, the housing, housing um, social housing list and so on. Um, we've had the, you know, the whole kind of, you know, motherhood and apple, uh, apple pie stress on meritocracy, which leaves a lot of people feeling very resentful, I think. You know, the idea that, you know, um, you know people like Nick Clegg, you know, go around, you know, basically saying, we've got to save you working class people from your horrible little lives, and you've got to become like us and go to Russell Group Universities. Um, uh, I mean, uh, Justine Greening, who was our Education Secretary, made this extraordinary speech at the Social Mobility Commission a couple of years ago, in which she, she comes from Rotherham, she basically said, you know, when I was growing up in Rotherham, I used to dream of owning my own house, having a well-paid job, having a stimulating and challenging career, and I knew I couldn't have those things in Rotherham. I mean, many of you will know Rotherham, and this is not a one-horse town. It's a town of about 120,000 people. It's seen better days. The steel mills have closed. It's half an hour commute from Sheffield. I mean, there are a million and a half people who live in the, you know, in that South Yorkshire conurbation. Uh, the idea you cannot live an achieved life in Rotherham is a, I mean, well, it's partly true, and that is a bit of a problem. It's partly true, um, but it, sh you know, but it shouldn't be true, and it should not be said so insouciantly by a um, cabinet member. I mean, and obviously there are, you know, we have problems of economic geography that you don't have, um, and um, but then uh, anyway. Um, Family policy, I think, you know, anywheres tend to have a bias against the private realm, a bias against domesticity. Um, we have, you know, I mean, all our family and gender policy is about making it as easy as possible for both parents to spend as little time in the family as possible. That's not much of a family policy, in my view. Um, um, the, 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 the kind of technocratic depoliticization that Ivan Rogers talked about. And I think that, I think it's really interesting to... Sovereignty often matters more to people who have relatively little in their own lives, I think. Uh, you know, if, you're, if you are a highly educated, relatively affluent anywhere, you kind of get why we have to kind of trade things off between, you know, in order to sort of have more leverage over, you know, I don't know, the sort of, you know, the bond markets or the environment. You know, obviously you have to, you have to dissolve your sovereignty. Um, you have to share your sovereignty with other people. People sort of get that. Um, you know, in, you know, you're in anywhere, you get that, you, you know, you probably have a friend who works at the OECD, you know, you're kind of in that world, you understand the trade-offs. If your own life has very little feeling of sovereignty, I think you, you kind of identify more with the levers of national sovereignty that seem to be disappearing. Um, anyway, um, how, am, am I, I'm not running over yet, I hope, am I? Um, not yet. Okay. Um, I mean, to, 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 very quickly, I mean, I, mean I, I touched on this earlier. I mean, I think um, <coughs> most of the people who have been voting for populist parties, most of the people who voted for Brexit are not bad people. Uh, I call them decent populists, meaning that they've accepted, most of them, not all of them, but most of them have accepted what I call the great liberalisation of the last 30 or 40 years on race, on gender, on sexuality. You know, just have to think about... Um, about um, homosexuality, about 60, 65% of people in Britain 
as recently as the late 80s thought that homosexuality was wrong, and now, what, 70, 75% of people support gay marriage. I mean, you've seen, that doesn't mean to say that they're liberals. I mean, I think what they tend to be is kind of David Owenite hard centrists. They tend to, the, the American political scientist Daniel Bell, end of ideology, cultural contradiction of capitalism, he's dead now, but he, he was interviewed by a journalist, I think, in the 1980s, and he talked about um, how... He was asked for his political credo, basically. He said, I'm a, I'm a kind of market-friendly... I'm translating slightly. I'm a market-friendly social democrat in economics. I'm a liberal in politics. And I'm somewhat conservative in social and cultural matters. I think that's the kind of hidden majority in our societies. For all sorts of historical and contingent reasons, we've not seen the party system, the party system create a party that captures that, that sort of triad. Um, partly because the left went off in a, in, a, in a quite a sort of libertarian, culturally libertarian direction in the sort of 60s and 70s uh, and never really returned. Um, uh, the, the right obviously became very free market in the, in the 80s. Um, I think actually probably the closest in my adult lifetime, the closest we've got to that kind of bell hidden majority was the Tory manifesto at the last election in the UK, um, which was by Tory standards very left of centre somewhat culturally conservative, I mean, obviously kind of emphasising nation-state, restricting immigration through honouring the Brexit vote and so on. Um, but anyway, um, so um, the, w w you know, how does this impact on the, on the, the, the I mean, obviously <laughs> Brexit has been sort of collateral damage in this value division. Um, the fact that people have not had the opportunity to sort of express their discontent with the new consensus, because the new consensus was so strongly established in all, all the major political parties. So general elections were, I mean, uh, there's some statistic, I can't remember what it is exactly, but something like um, three or was it four million of the people that voted, f voted um, for leave had not voted in the preceding five or six general elections. It was that, it was that kind of non-voter, people who thought, you're all the same, because to a certain extent they were right. You know, they were all the same on many of the very basic things that I've described. Um, and my dad, you know, I think the average Brexit voter would have certainly been happy enough with a kind of... Uh, I mean, w one of the great opportunities that I think was missed, and actually um, David Owen, coincidentally, was one of the few British politicians, I think, to argue strongly for this, was that the, you know, the idea of a more sort of two-tier um, evolution of the European Union... Um, and, and in, a, in a sense, the creation of the euro provided an opportunity for that. Um, and in a way, Britain's natural role would have been as leader of the outer ring of the European Union. Um, not only not being in Schengen and the euro, but also not being in, in the free movement regime, at least as it was post-1992. That, that would obviously have kind of solved the problem in some ways. But I think we kind of lacked the... We lacked the kind of statecraft in some ways. I think... You know, I think pro probably after the Second World War generation died out or left politics, people didn't sort of think in sort of strategic terms so much. But also there was a sort of coincidental fact that when this was happening, I mean, wh when, when it was clear that the euro was going to be political and not e economic, um, it was going to include um, the countries that probably shouldn't have, I mean, with all due respect to Ireland, possibly including you, um, countries that shouldn't really have been in a kind of hard... Euro, um, when it was clear that it was going to be political and not economic, uh, that was the time when we should have been saying, right, you know, let's go for a proper two-tier European Union. Um, but it was, of course, that was just the time in the run-up to 1997, Tony Blair, with, it was our sort of second go at a kind of neo-federalism after, after the Ted Heath era. Um, Anyway, um, hurry, hurry, hurry. Um, okay, a bit of Brexit. Um, so, um, yeah, this is not May 1940. Uh, this is not the winter of discontent. This is not even 2008. Um, you know, we are going to leave the European Union. We are not going to destroy our, all our relationships. Um, we are going to remain as close as possible economically. Um, and I do think, um, yeah, I mean, you know... I mean, the best joke really about, about Brexit is that we used to be, um, you know, when we were in the European Union, we were, we were kind of half in, half out, and after Brexit, it's going to be the other way around. Um, 
Um, and I think that's basically it, really. Um, um, you know, I mean, of course, but I do think, you know, I mean, the way in which Remain is going you know, to cark on about economics and, you know, we've, we've spent almost all of our, all of the time, including talking about the, the, um, the Irish backstop, talking about money. Brexit isn't really about money. I mean, the best single slogan, I think, to sum up um, <coughs> Brexit is it's in meaning, not money, um, about, about the things, about the value things that I've been talking about. Um, and, I, and it is sort of extraordinary how, um, I mean, I, I mean I, I, everyone says it's a mess, and of course it is a mess, but in, in some ways it's a kind of healthy democratic mess, and it was an almost impossible situation for the British political class. I mean, nobody had expected the vote to go the way it did. Um, you know, the voters bowled a complete googly at the, at the political class by, by voting to leave by a pretty narrow margin, but a, but a decisive enough one. Um, and of course, without, I mean, it was impossible for, for the Leave campaign to come up with a sort of collective, coherent idea of what Leave would be. I mean, that was bound to be, as it were, sort of a post referendum matter. Um, and in my language, I mean, you know, Brexit has, has, been, has been essentially a somewhere vote being uh, implemented by very reluctant anywheres both in the political class, what, 75% of MPs? Obviously, the entirety of Whitehall were absolutely horrified. You know? um, uh, their heart was, to put it mildly, not in it. And they, of course, we've compounded that by making mistakes. I mean, you know, Theresa May has you know, the political acumen of a tree. Um, um, you know, we should never have triggered Article 50 before coming to at least a bit more of a consensus than, than we had. Appalling management of, of public opinion. Um, particularly leave of public opinion. She sort of lurched off into the hard Brexit at the beginning and then um, has been sort of backtracking all the way without managing leave or expectation or reaching out to Remainers, uh, allowed the EU to set the agenda. I mean, they were always going to set the agenda, but, um, you know, the, the whole sequencing thing. Um, and then just the political failure to sell what is a potentially really attractive deal. I think her deal is potentially really attractive. It kind of takes us back to 1973 in a way, which is, I think, where a lot of moderate leavers and moderate remainers will be happy to be. Um, you know, remaining as close as possible economically, but, but, but regaining sovereignty in important areas um, and not, you know, not being part of the kind of integrationist train. Um, I do think we will get a deal. I think the DUP are desperately looking for a way out. Um, but uh, well, perhaps we can talk about what that might look like. And we are in, in obviously in this sort of multi-dimensional game of chess, which is mainly about everybody being able to save face. Um, um, I do think, sort of almost in parenthesis, I think some of the, um, some of the writing, in both in the UK and in Ireland, I'm thinking particularly of Fintan O'Toole, is, notion that, that uh, we're all sort of desperate to recreate the empire. I mean, it's absolutely puerile. Um, there is no yearning for empire in Britain, I can absolutely assure you. Um, indeed, what's remaining, actually, reading all that stuff made me go back and read some of the stuff. What is remarkable is actually how little anti-decolonization spirit and movement there was in, in Britain in the sort of 50s and 60s. There were a few crazies in the... Monday Club and a few people who represented you know, white settlers in southern Africa. Um, but if you compare it to France, Portugal, lots of other countries, lots of other European countries that had extensive land empires, um, had, serious, had their politics seriously disrupted by anti-decolonization movements, obviously particularly France. We obviously had no equivalent to the four, four million pieds noirs in Algeria. Um, but, you know, think of the... You know, the, 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 the dominant politicians in the Tory party in the 1960s, people like Ian MacLeod, Ted Heath, uh, Reginald Maudling, none of them were interested in empire. Um, that, that it's just not, it's a complete myth. Or rather, what is it? It's confusing, I think, a desire for sovereignty, and that may be particularly strong in a country that has had an empire or has been a kind of rule maker rather than a rule taker. I completely concede that point. That, that, but I think it's more than that. I think it's that, that quite a big part, particularly of English identity, um, is based around political institutions. 
you know, you, you sort of send a postcard from London, it'll have Big Ben on it. Um, it'll, it's, it, the, the our, um, partly because, you know, the English language is obviously not ours, um, you know, uh, whereas, you know, m most continental European countries have an identity that is, that is, that is sort of based on language, on culture, on way of life, on cuisine, or whatever. I mean, our identities, I think, are much more tied up in political institutions, which has made the European Union a much more painful experience for the British in some ways. And, and yes, you may say that is partly to do with having historically been a, a kind of rule maker rather than rule taker, but um, the yearning, if there is a yearning, is for, is for self-government and sovereignty, not to dominate other countries. Um, but, um, um, quick, 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 um, just, I mean, um, just a quick thing, obviously we've had the, the Gang of Seven um, yesterday, I mean, we're in this, you know, I mean, something that perhaps is making Brexit even harder is the fact that our, our, our sort of party structure is, is sort of in flux, or you might argue actually not in flux enough, um, <coughs> that, that the, these new identities, um, new identities have emerged, obviously, from the Brexit vote. And um, John Curtis, the political scientist, um, I think did, did some research finding that, that um, of, the, of, of the voters in the, in the 2017 election, only 30% of them identified very strongly with the parties they'd voted for. But 80% of people identify very strongly with their Remainer or Leave a vote. Um, so, um, the, the, I mean, the, the interesting thing to watch, I guess, in the next couple of years is to what extent those identities will either form the basis of new p political parties, <coughs> tricky in a first-past-the-post system, you know, this is not, you know, Italy, uh, you know, we have a party in government that didn't exist five years ago, um, you know, it's obviously much easier in, in, in proportional representation systems to create new parties, much harder in the UK with our system, so, it's, you know, so it may be that the existing parties will get taken over by these by these identities. I mean, that's, that's the, um, the interesting thing to watch. Um, the, the 2017 election itself, I mean, was often seen as a kind of backlash against the backlash. You know, we had the, you know, Brexit was the sort of backlash against 30 years of the double liberalism. We then had, <coughs> you know, all the kids who'd stayed in bed on June, or whatever it was, 2016, actually managed to get out of bed and, and vote in 2017 for the ridiculous Jeremy Corbyn. Um, but, it was kind of seen as a sort of youth backlash. I think actually, um, as the sort of dust has settled, it's become clear it wasn't quite so much of a youth backlash as we thought. Um, there were, the, you know, there were these various issues, tuition fees and housing shortages and so on. But I think a lot of people voted Labour despite feeling that you know that Corbyn was was really not a serious figure um, because everybody assumed she was going to win such a large majority. I mean, you don't often start an election campaign 22 points ahead in the polls. Um, and uh, I don't think there's been a huge lurch to the left. I mean, there's been, um, I mean, the, the Corbyn phenomenon is a sort of interesting thing in its own right, um, but that's a, sort of, that's a sort of party coup. I don't think it represents a deep sort of, deep structure in British society, although it is true that, um, the over-expansion of higher education has produced a, a large class of people who expect to get reasonably well-paid, secure, middle-class professional jobs. Um, and I think it's probably true that they are not there for all sorts of reasons. I mean, all those, and those that are there are often very heavily re routinized. They're kind of administrative, routinized jobs, um, you know, so-called digital tailorism. Um, also, these jobs, I'm not a pessimist about AI. I think, you know, we'll always, you know, technological change always produces new jobs where it takes them away too. Um, but I do think, you know, these are the kinds of sort of middle level uh, professional administrative jobs that are being done by the kind of the new class of people, who, many of whom are the first person in their family ever to go into higher education. They are going to be very vulnerable to AI and also to, to export to the Philippines. You know, increasingly, you know, now that global internet really does work pretty well, you really can, you can really, um, you can subcontract these jobs to places where you pay people, you know, one tenth of what you pay here. Um, so I don't think I don't think there is a, a big lurch to the left. I think there is a bit of austerity fatigue, which is a slightly different thing. Um, um, but I think um, final. Let me go final because um, um, what. Um,
um, what I'm sort of interested in is, um, in a sense, kind of leaving Brexit on one side. You know, I mean, how do we how do we bring these two value groups together more? How do we, you know, what, what is the common ground? Um, you know, I mean, you, it, we might be going through sort of a sort of value divide version of the kind of class conflict we saw in Britain in the 1970s. And people used to talk, if you remember, um, of a sort of stalemate in a way. You know, you had these very, very powerful organized labor in the 1970s, you know, and, and, and a sort of, you know, a, a, a strong organized middle class, you might say, too. Um, and they were sort of, neither side was strong enough to kind of assert itself until Margaret Thatcher appears at the end of the 70s. Um, and I mean, maybe that we're going through a sort of similar sort of standoff, but in a, in a sort of more in a kind of value conflict form. Um, so, I mean, I think it's interesting to just sort of reflect on how we can, how the logjam can be broken. Um, um, I, I, I do think, um, I do think part of it does come down to anywhere as being more emotionally intelligent, recognizing the extent of their domination over recent decades, conceding that they are, their worldview, you know, actually adopting some of the pluralism that they claim to believe in, actually accepting that, that there are small C conservative views that are perfectly decent and legitimate. Not everybody has to be a Russell Group University liberal. Um, and um, um, I do think that means trying to sort of shift, yeah, like I said in an earlier slide, that too much status has sort of accumulated itself around cognitive functions. We see the world far too, and for example, just a, a final example perhaps. Um, People say that, uh, you know, what is an explanation for the fact that people who work in social care homes are so poorly paid? Um, I mean, leave aside the, the, the fact that uh, local authorities pay for the, at least for the public side of it, and that depends on central government, and that's subject to austerity and so on. But, the, but a, a, a labour economist would say, well, they get low paid because anybody can do that job. Well, we all know that is not true. I mean, any of you who have elderly relatives who in a social care home or in a hospital know there are good carers, there are middling carers, and there are frankly crap carers in many of these places. Um, but because we're judging, we're, we're kind of judging by cognitive criterion, you know, that you don't need A-levels to work in a social care home. So anybody can do the job, but not everybody can do the job. Um, and we need to become much more aware of the way in which sort of cognitive thinking has become uh, sort of over hegemonic in our in our heads, and we need to somehow shift status and value more to things like caring functions um, and manual and technical functions, and obviously that's partly about money. You know, status tends to follow the money, um, and I think there are signs that we are moving in that direction. As I said, I mean, AI I think is going to remove a lot of the sort of middling strata of. Um, I mean, a lot of kind of anywhere politics has been based, I think, on the myth that we're just going to go on creating more and more middle-class professional jobs. Well, we're not. Um, you know, we'll still need lots of very clever people to run our organisations and to invent new drugs and whatever, but a lot of the kind of middling um, professional middle-class jobs are going to disappear. And I, and I guess I hope that will make those people potentially more sympathetic to the idea of sort of shifting, shifting the value bounds, as it were. Um, um, and for a very final point, um, yeah, so this is really about, you know, how, how can liberals and small-c conservatives live better together? Um, I mean, obviously, the Brexit vote has not been a very good advertisement for sorting these things out, but I think sorted it will be. I think this time next year, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the Tory party are, are riding a wave of popularity, having got the deal through, will be in the middle of negotiations, but it'll be reasonably clear where the kind of end point is. Um, the people people don't realise they like the deal as much as they actually do at the moment, um, partly because she's been so terrible at selling it. Um, but there are, you know, there are places in Europe where the combination does work. I mean, you think of, um, of Bavaria, you know, laptops and lederhosen. Bavaria is the most economically dynamic part of the whole of Europe, for goodness sakes. It's one of the richest parts of Europe, and yet it's also one of the most socially conservative parts of Europe. You know, the, all the kind of shicky mickeys in Munich who sit around inventing their apps or whatever they do, um, uh, you know, they think that, that Bavaria belongs to them, but so do the little farmers outside 
Munich, uh, you know, in their funny leather trousers, um, they think it belongs to them too. And it, does, it belongs to both of them. And they somehow managed to create this rather, rather, rather good thing. I think they're, they're a model for, for all of us, actually perhaps more for Ireland than for Britain. Um, you should be the new Bavaria. Perhaps you are already the new Bavaria. <laughs> um, but the shikimiki, I think the shikimikis in Munich, the, the Irish version of them, possibly have too much power at the moment. So you need to think about that you're equivalent to the guys in the leather trousers. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>